chapter. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repayeth them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes, and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to this judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. And he will love thee, and bless thee, and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, and thy wine, and thine oil, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you, or cattle, or among your cattle. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon them that hate thee. And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eyes shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. If thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shall well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh, uh, and unto all Egypt, the great temptations which thine eyes saw, and the signs, and the wonders, and the mighty hand, and the stretched out arm, whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out. So shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them, until they, are, until they that are left, and hide themselves from thee, be destroyed. Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with mighty destruction, until they be destroyed. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou have destroyed them. 
the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Dear God, I pray God you be with me now, Lord, help me to deliver this sermon as I speak in truth. I pray God that you would keep my mind clear, Lord, and focus and steadfast on the message that you have for these people today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm talking today about the faithful God, the faithful God. And I'm noticing it every time as I turn to another passage in Deuteronomy. Some of it seems repetitive. He keeps saying, you know, the Lord thy God will bring thee to this, such and such a place. He will keep thee if thou keep the commandments. And he's always reaffirming those same statements over and over. But each one of these chapters seems to have a different theme to it. And that's what I found as I've gone. This one's no different. I believe Deuteronomy 7 is talking of the faithful God and actually lifting him up as an example and showing that we ought to be faithful as he is. Look there in verse 1. And it says, when, okay, so this is, this is an assurity statement. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it. So it's, it's giving the aff affirmation that when the Lord thy God shall bring thee, and it's going to give some instructions to follow after. When he brings you, that's the promise to carry you into it. When somebody brings something with them, that item is just along for the ride. If I was to just grab this pen, I'm going to bring this pen with me. The pen really has no choice. It's just along for the ride. And God's making this statement unto the people of Israel. When I bring you into this land, in other words, he's going here and he's bringing you along for the ride is what, is what Moses here is going to tell to his people. He's going, God is going, and you too along for the ride. He says, to the land whither thou goest. Again, it's almost as if there's no option. God's going to bring them. God's going to carry them to the land whither thou goest. You're going there whether you like it or not. God has a destination for you. It says, when the Lord has cast out. Now, like this too, we have no option in going where God wants to bring us. These nations have no option of where God's going to cast them. He's going to cast out these seven nations, it says. The Hittites, the Girgashites, so on down to the Jebusites. It says seven nations greater and mightier than thou. These seven nations are greater than the people of Israel. They are mightier than the people of Israel. And yet they have no choice but to remove away from God's people as God brings them in and places them in their place where they were before. You're removed. You have no option. Where is God's people going? Where God wants them. They have no option either. He's going to bring them along, and he promises to carry them in. The Lord is faithful, and God is so faithful towards us that sometimes he even pushes us to prevail. Sometimes we don't feel like we can overcome. We don't feel like we can succeed. We don't feel like we're going to win the battle, right? But God pushes you to prevail. He's saying the same thing to the people of Israel at this time. These seven nations are greater than you. These seven nations are mightier than you. But I'm going to bring you to overcome them. I'm going to remove them and put you in, your, in their place. God is faithful to even push us to prevail in situations when we don't think we can. Verse 2, and it says... And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. He's promising here that these greater and mightier enemies will be destroyed and utterly smitten. Not a remnant of them as, as, as he promises to bring them into that, the, the promised land. He says, your enemies, your challenges... Your hardships, even for us, we can, by extension, read a verse like this and just take that promise and say, you know what? Even my sins, even my, 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 my biggest struggles that I have in that area are nothing before God that has promised I can smite, I can utterly destroy through Him if I trust Him to bring me in. 
He says of the people of Israel back in the context now that you shall smite and utterly destroy the enemies that are in the land that I promised you. This was their land. Uh uh, not anymore. It's time that they be removed. I am going to bring you in, he promises. In the context, these are seven nations that are greater and mightier. Seven nations which on their own Israel would have no chance to stand up against. Read the second part of Deuteronomy 7 and verse 2. It says, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. He says, of these nations that I promise you, you will smite and utterly destroy and take their land. He says, you shall not make a covenant with them. You shall not have mercy upon them as you enter in. You shall not make any marriages with them. And the Christian mind ought to think of things like this and apply them to our own hearts and say, okay, when I am entering into a heathen situation, whether it's my workplace, whether it's my, my, my school place, whatever it is, the situation where there are unbelievers, where there are nations that are greater and stronger than our, and they're not like our people, they're, they don't have the same spot as God's people have. He says, Christians, we, I believe Christians ought to take something like this and be mindful of that fact and say, regarding heathen people, we ought to have that same mentality where we should have no covenant with them, we should have no mercy upon them, and make no marriages with them. Keep your finger there in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> Certainly we can have mercy for unbelievers, but if they're the type of heathen, rejected of God, reprobate unbelievers that we find are referred to in the promised land, remember when we read back in, uh, in Deuteronomy, also in Leviticus, we learned of these nations that they had committed all the abominations, wherefore God hated them and would cast them out of the land. But we don't, by and large, just come into contact with just these types of people all the time. General population, yeah, Christians should have mercy upon these people, right? Have a little grace, have a little mercy, extend them, extend them, do love where even it's not always deserved or reciprocated. But covenant and marriage are something that Christians should definitely not be yoking ourselves up with when it comes to unbelievers. Read there in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers okay so this isn't even the worst kind of unbelief this is just somebody that doesn't believe on Christ somebody that's just not saved somebody that's just just not a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ has trusted him for salvation God says don't be unequally yoked don't have an unbalanced in your yoking with them this is like if an ox is yoking up with a cat there's an unequal yoking here. This is this is an ox doing all the work and the and the, the the trolley actually going in circles because the other is not pulling its weight in that yoke, in that relationship. Okay? So it says, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? We have Christ's righteousness as a believer. Therefore, we ought not to yoke up with somebody that is trying to stand more often than not in their own righteousness, which is filthy rags. So we have Christ's righteousness, they don't. What fellowship have you that you have with that scenario? What communion hath light with darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. Light enters a room and darkness leaves, hides itself into a corner. They don't have any communion. They don't get along, right? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What Christ says, what, what concord, what agreement has Christ with the devil? They're opposites. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel or an unbeliever. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? They don't. They're complete opposite. There is no agreement. There is no opportunity for a yoking. There should be no compromise. The Bible is clear. It says, For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And that's a quote from Deuteronomy. He said it over and over and over and over, that I will be their God. They shall be holy. They shall be righteous. They shall be 
firmly fixed and set upon following after me. So he says this in verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Of course, we become the sons and, God, uh, and daughters of God by faith and believing, but we act that out by coming out and being separate, like we were just talking about. If somebody has believed for one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, you would expect to see some growth, especially in some things like like drinking alcohol, some things like, like, like partying and being reckless. You would expect to see some sort of change. And even if they're not, even if this person is not, I can, I can even take this a stretch farther. We're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but how can we then even yoke ourselves up with somebody that they may be saved, but they're living like the devil? They're running around with the world. They're running around with whosoever they can. They're partying. They're, they're full of drunkenness. They're not following after God. That too can lend itself to an unequally yoked scenario. Where even a Christian that is faithful and trusting God and trying to be a good steward of the mysteries of God that he has given them and trying to live right and trying to act right and trying to do right, if they go and in a marriage yoke themselves up together with somebody that they could be saved but they're just not interested in following God, that's going to be an unequally yoked partnership. And the interesting thing that you always find about these, these relationships where God commands that there actually should be a separation. Come out from among them. Don't, don't take on a yoke with somebody who's an unbeliever. Don't take on a yoke with somebody who just is content to be saved and faithless and live like the devil. The thing that you'll always notice in these scenarios is that the one who is lower will always pull the other down. If I'm walking on a spiritual high and my wife isn't interested, she's always going to pull me down. You can, you can, you can uh, show that very simply. If I was to just jump up on this chair now, it would be very easy for someone lower than me to pull me down. When you're playing sports, people always talk about you know, getting your center of gravity lower because when you're in a lower plane, you actually are more able to pull somebody else down, to push somebody else over. And so that's what you find. Whenever anybody's in an unequally yoked scenario, the person who is riding high does not often pull the other up to their level, but rather they suffer loss as a result of that unequal partnership. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God gives us the, the plainest and simplest example of that, and that these are unbelievers. These are rejected of God unbelievers, wicked people unbelievers. And it says in verse 4, regarding the marriages, and if one believer were to take on an unbeliever, it says, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So I can make all of these examples I want, but the Bible says it very clear here. That if you're yoking together with an unbeliever or with the, the wrong person that is not in the, interested in getting in the yoke with Christ with you, not interested in serving Christ with you, they will turn you away from following Christ. They will cause you to serve other gods. And we need to look no further than the Bible truth that's being presented here in verse 4 and just by faith believe that. We can also go through the scriptures and find an example like Solomon. He took on many wives and what happened? He had his heart torn away from following after God and instead he started to serve these other devils just to appease his many wives that he had taken on. He became unequally yoked together with unbelievers and it caused him to serve other gods and it actually caused that the anger of God would be kindled against him and he would be destroyed suddenly as a result in the latter days of his life. Great misery fell over Solomon because of that. And he, and he cried out and wrote, wrote, song, uh, wrote Song of Solomon full of, full of mourning and Ecclesiastes full of understanding of that, that everything is vanity next to serving Christ. They will turn you, and when you turn, that's when God turns. And in his anger, he brings destruction upon the believer, and they're punished as a result of it. James chapter 4 and verse 8 says, Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. 
The exact opposite of what we see here. When you turn away from God, he'll turn away from you. When you draw nigh unto God, you will draw nigh unto you. We need to not covenant with unbelievers, but covenant with God and those that wish to covenant in the same way with God. People that pull you up, people that walk with you, want have a, have a similar direction. I believe that's what we have here in this church. People that have a direction towards Christ and want to get to know Christ more. And when we get together in the yoke, we're all pulling in the same direction. Great things will get done. And great things have already gotten done through this church. We need to think the same way in regard to our personal relationships. Look on to verse 5. It says, But... Thus shall ye deal with them. So rather than covenant and yoke up with the unbelievers, with these seven nations that are greater and mightier than you, those nations that you're supposed to go in and smite and destroy as God carries you in, rather than covenant, yoke up with them, have mercy on them, what should you do? Verse 5 says, But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. Notice it gives no opportunity for compromise. Everything that has to do with their gods and serving them, destroy it. Rid the land of it. We got an example of that in, uh, you can keep your finger and go to Second Chronicles chapter 35. 2 Chronicles chapter 35. And it's actually pretty rare. 2 Chronicles 34, sorry. Few of the kings of Israel actually followed through with what God had planned. First of all, there was never supposed to be a king. Second of all, when they were to enter into lands, when they were to be in the promised land, they were to ensure that the idols were destroyed. The altars were taken down. The images were removed. The groves were gone. Everything was burned up with fire. We do have an example, and there's a couple. Second Chronicles chapter 34, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, he's 16 now, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places, and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence, and the images which were high above them he cut down, and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them, and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon the altars, and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh, and Ephraim, and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves, and had beaten the graven images into powder, and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned unto Jerusalem. His work was done. All these lands that he had entered into, he just had it in his heart to do right in the sight of God. And doing right in the sight of God meant to destroy everything that was contrary to him. The people of the lands had turned themselves to offering unto idols, to sacrificing unto devils, to seeking after other gods, and filled the whole land with idolatry. And the first thing that this good king did, he's eight years old, sought the Lord, 16 years old, he went on a breaking spree, and he just started destroying all these things. He was faithful in doing that. Few were faithful as Josiah. And that definition of faithful has three different subterms to it. So the one that is faithful is loyal. They are constant. They are steadfast. And it's God's intention that His people have those characteristics. God's intention and His perfect will for His people is that we would be faithful to Him entirely. Loyal, constant, steadfast, just focused entirely and solely upon God. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. We ought to behave that way and take an example like this. What is God saying? He's saying these nations are wicked. Go in and destroy them. We can apply that to people that we know that are unbelievers in our lives that we've had to remove ourselves from. We can apply that 
to people at the workplace that we have to remove ourselves from. We can just apply it to the nation that we live in and, and how wicked and uh, ungodly it is. And we can separate ourselves. When we do so, we, we set ourselves up to, to be loyal, constant, steadfast towards God. And in doing so, we separate ourselves, making no covenant, making no marriages, because we're focused on following God and doing what He wants. We ought to be special. We ought to be unique. We ought to be a separated people unto God, as it says in verse 6. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. So we are holy unto Him. He considers us holy. And today in Christ, you are considered holy. Why? Not because of my own righteousness, but according to His mercy, He saved me, regenerated me, washed me, makes me whiter than snow in Christ. And therefore, I too am a holy person unto the Lord my God. The Lord thy God, it says, hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are on the face of the earth. God has such a high regard for us, we should be then faithful to him. We should be loyal, constant, steadfast. Why? Because he looks upon us and he says, you're holy, you're special, you're chosen. Above all the people of the world, I have separated you unto myself. All that's left is for you to act like it. Be separate, be different, be distinct from the people that are around you. Make no marriages with them, have no mercy with them, smite and destroy them, proverbially speaking. For us, of course, but for these it was with an actual sword. That's how serious God was about the separation. In Christ, we are different. We are special. We are chosen. We are above all people. And it's not because of who we are, but it's because of who Christ is and what he did for us. You can continue on and find out a little bit more about the heart of God in this. Verse 7, it says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep his oath which we had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He didn't set his love upon you because you were anything special. Rather, he loved you first, give opportunity for you to love him back, and then you entered into that covenant relationship, which is final and sure and, and solid in Jesus Christ. That will never be shaken. That will never be forsaken as the covenant that we're looking at in Deuteronomy was. Of course, they didn't obey and God would change his mind and remove from keeping the oath because they broke it. But we've entered into a covenant that we can never exit. And Deuteronomy 7 verse 6 actually gives a little bit of a foresight to that. It says, Thou art a holy people unto God, chosen special above all people. We are there by faith in Christ. They too could have been there by faith in Christ. Of course, their works would determine how they actually lived on this plane of earth, but it would never change the fact that they're holy, chosen, special above all people. Why? Because God loved them enough to set them so. And when he set them so, he desired in his heart and fulfilled it faithfully, as he had said, when he brought them out, redeemed them from the hand of Pharaoh, and showed himself faithful so that we could see that example and be faithful to him. He did it because he loved us even when we were the least. He acted out the same love for, towards the people of Israel. Even though they were the least among all people, he gave them his great love. He cared for them enough to reach out in that way. And we ought to, as he is, be faithful. Our God is faithful. And his desire, again, was to keep that oath. God didn't intend that man would rebel and turn from him, and that he would have to break his side of the bargain, which in, in this context is the land promise, right? Because we can read through this, and we're going to see time and time again as we go through Deuteronomy, if you will obey, then I will. And God had to break his commandment because they simply did not uphold it. So he broke the covenant, not because he's unrighteous, but finding fault with them 
the Bible records, he had to turn from that oath. But that was not his desire. God is loyal. God is constant. God is steadfast. And he wanted us to be found loyal, constant, steadfast, faithful unto him as well. He loved us enough to bring us out, to redeem us. Now what does that do for your heart? Doesn't that provoke you to do the same for God? As God reaches out and despite everything that we are, wants to be loyal, constant, steadfast, determined to just love us and keep us and carry us and have the best for us, that should provoke your heart to want to do the same thing for Him. And when we all think long and hard about it, we all have that in our hearts because God has put the Spirit of God in us that spirit that cries, Abba, Father, that, that spirit that is, is in us always seeking to do right by God. Of course, our flesh gets in the way all the time. But we have in us the desire to do right, to be found faithful towards God, and yet we don't do it. But it should. We should be provoked within us to do right by Him, be faithful to Him. Now, knowing God, does that create that desire in us? Does it create us to be faithful as He is? Here, when we read the context of Deuteronomy chapter 7, we find it time and time again that there is a goodness and a severity to God. If you are for Him, He is all the way for you. He, just as much as you get sold out, draw nigh unto Him, He will get sold out and draw nigh unto you and bless you and keep you and strengthen you and provide everything that you could possibly need. But if you're His enemy, quick and utter destruction is, is, is on the doorstep as well. There's goodness, there's severity with God. And all that is generally dependent upon your actions, your choices, what you decide to do with what you know about God. Look at verse 9. It says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God. That's the first thing we need to understand about. He's God. He is the boss. He is in charge. He is the creator. He is the king of kings, Lord of lords, above all. No beginning, no end, right? He is God. Know this therefore, He is God, the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. That's faithfulness. That's loyalty. That's constant and steadfastness. Is a God that is faithful, a God that is above you and yet would come down to your level to give you, uh, give you blessings and mercy to a thousand generations. He continues and says, and repayeth them that hate them to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him, but he will repay him to his face. This is one of those things where you just, you look at it and you're like, you know, I set before you this day life and death. Choose life, right? You can either know God, you can believe God, trust his faithfulness and lean on him and have his mercy into a thousand generations, or you can hate God and find him repaying you to your face. Literally, God standing face to face with you and saying, I, I have, I've, got, I've got recompense to make towards you this day. That's the goodness and severity that we need to understand about our God. God isn't all love and, and, and pie in the sky and the big guy in the sky like people want to think he is. He's also not all wrath and destruction and hate like people want to think he is. But God renders unto whom he will what he will. If you, if, you, if you love Him, if you seek after Him, God's there to love you and draw you near unto Him. If you want to hate Him and despise Him and do nothing of what He wants, don't be, despised, don't be surprised when He repays you to your faith. Be faithful, follow Him, and that's how you enter into a good relationship with the faithful God. Now, He continues on, and in verse 11 it says, Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. So knowing the knowing the, the, the goodness and the severity of God that we've just read in those opening in those, those previous two verses, verses 9 and 10, Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments. That's just a good recommendation. Because God would destroy you as you hate him to his face, to your face, you should, therefore, thou shalt therefore keep his commandments, his statutes, and judgments today to do them. Then you shall have life. And here's an if you will statement again. Okay, verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass, okay, this is a promise that this will come to pass. This, this is how things are going to play out. If... Ye hearken to these judgments. In other words, you hear them and you retain them. It says there, and keep and do them. 
So you're absorbing them, you're keeping them, understanding them, applying them by doing them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. So if he will listen to the commandments, keep the commandments, do the commandments, the promise here to the people of Israel, and even to you as you walk in the Spirit, is that God will keep his covenant, his promises, his mercy, he will carry you through. Verse 13 says, and he will love thee and bless thee, and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, and thy wine, and thine oil, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks, and of thy sheep, in the land which he swore unto thy fathers to give it to thee. God is promising multiplication, fruitfulness, love, and blessing upon those that, what? Hearken to the judgments, keep the judgments, do the judgments here in the land of promise. Verse 14 it says, Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. Again, fruitfulness and a blessing above all people comes to those that know their God, know his statutes, keep his judgments, and follow after them to do them. Verse 16, And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord Sorry, I'm on verse 15. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. Isn't that a great verse to just own in a time like this? He will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, a type of the world, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon them that hate thee. It's saying that there's diseases that you know about that Egypt is experiencing, and God promises that if you diligently hearken, keep, and do the commandments, that he won't put those things upon you. Rather, he'll protect you from these. It continues on in verse 16. It says, And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eye shall have no pity on them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. In other words, you will be delivered from traps. You won't be sucked into the lies that are going on around you. You won't be consumed by the people that are trying to feign and, and lie before you in order that they could have some mercy. Rather, you will be swift and righteous in your judgment. Clarity of mind, deliverance from traps and snares. These are all the promises that God's making if you hearken to his judgments. Keep his statutes and do them. The Bible records that his commandments are not grievous. Every single commandment that you give is the best thing for you. And when you do what's best for you, isn't it great that God just blesses you more for doing what's best for you? It's like a double portion of the blessings of Almighty God. Simply by hearkening to the judgments, keeping the judgments, and doing the judgments. Being faithful in these areas. Being faithful, again, it means to be... Being, being faithful, it means to be loyal. It means to be constant. It means to be steadfast in these things. Verse 17 says, If thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? It's, it's a doubt statement being made. These troubles are more than I can bear. These nations are greater than I. How am I going to ever dispossess them? I have all this debt. I have all these sicknesses. I have all these troubles and struggles in my life. Sins are besetting me. I'm trying to do right, but I always find myself doing wrong. The Bible says that even when you're making these doubtful statements, God will encourage us to be more faithful in those times. Be more loyal. Be more constant. Be more steadfast. We've got to remember that with God, the possibilities are endless, for with God, all things are possible. And that's exactly what it says in verse 17. It says, when you shall say in thine heart, I can't do this. Look at verse 18. Thou shalt not be afraid. When I start to doubt, the Bible says in verse 18, thou shalt not be afraid. When I start to worry and say, I can never dispossess these nations. They're greater. They're mightier than I. When I start to doubt and say that in my heart, Thou shalt not be afraid of them. Instantly, as soon as I doubt and I worry, God puts more faith into me. Just builds me up with more strength. How? But shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. Do you know what God does to you every single time you start to doubt when you're actually devoted 
separated, following after him, not yoked with unbelievers, but being separated unto God, the moment you even doubt that you can overcome something, instantly God's like, here's some more faith. And how does he do it? By allowing that you shall well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh. Do you know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit of God bringing into remembrance all things whatsoever I have taught you. The ministry of the Spirit of God is that as soon as I'm doubting, there's a verse. As soon as I'm worried, there's a verse. As soon as I don't know and I'm confused, there's a verse. Bringing into remembrance all things whatsoever I have taught you is the ministry that Christ has for the Spirit of God. And so, we see that here, playing out in the Old Testament. I've said in my heart, I'm doubting. Here's a verse, I shall well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. I remember the stories, I remember the tales, I remember the trials I've been through and the glories that I have overcome. I've been, I've seen, I've, I've known the faithful God. In verse 19 it says, The great temptations which thine eyes saw, and the signs, and the wonders, and the mighty hand, and the stretched out arm, whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. The same things that are before you, giving you fear, are the same things that God will turn around upon them. He will take temptations and signs and wonders in a mighty hand and put them upon your enemies in order to build you up, showing himself faithful unto you. Reminding you of all of the things that you have read, yay, but also all of the things that you have been through. We talked about that a little bit earlier too. You get stronger every single time you go through a temptation, you go through a trial, you go through a struggle. Things that used to cripple you and destroy you and bring you to your knees two years ago is just water off a duck's back because you are stronger than you were then. Why? Because God has brought you through trials and showed you glories so that now today when you think in your heart, I can't do this, you're reminded of all that you have done to this day. You're reminded of all that you've been through up until this moment. God gives you a verse. He lifts you up. He strengthens you and brings you through. Verse 20 says, Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them until they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. And just when, you know, you got the Word encouraging you, you got God building you up, you got the Spirit of God reminding you of past glories and the words that you have heard, just, just, just for consolation, He's going to send in hornets to sting your enemies. He's just going to send in some sort of full-on attack, a miracle of God that a hornet would come and destroy your enemies that stand before you. God there showing Himself faithful. Verse 21, it says, Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. God's faithful. God's mighty. God's terrible. And he's yours. <laughs> he's your God. That's what we need to remember about him. He's ours. He's my Lord. He's my, he's my Savior. That terrible God, that mighty God, that faithful God, I don't need to fear him in the sense that I need to worry about falling under his wrath or having him send hornets upon me. No, he's on my side. So just give myself to him and he'll work in my corner at all times. I don't need to doubt and worry and fear. And even when I doubt, he's right there to give me more faith and feed me and build me up with it. Verse 22, I love this verse. It says, and the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee, look at this, by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. So there's the practical. They're a little nation, they go in, and then God just wipes out all these nations. Well now, all of the fields, the houses, all of the cities and towns, there's just not enough people to fill them, and so they get overgrown. My lawn at home right now is, is overgrown because I haven't tended to it. Imagine if I had 50 lawns. It would be just out of control. God here is saying, you're not going to take over the land all at once, because essentially you'll just be overrun by the amount of upkeep that's going to be required for it. But he says this, by little and little he will cast out these nations before you. And that's the same way that we grow by faith, by little and little. God doesn't just take you from, you know, having a little inheritance to just having a whole whack of inheritance overnight. 
having, having a little bit of growth as a Christian to just having a ton of growth. He doesn't do that for us. Why? We wouldn't be prepared for it. We wouldn't be able to absorb all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom, all of, the, all of what's required. Think about it. The things that I have overcome this year, again, eight years ago would have destroyed me. My wife and I were talking about that. We would have quit. We would have gone out of the race. Even like four or five years ago, if the things that happened this year happened four or five years ago, we probably would have just packed it in and quit. If God would have given us what we have today spiritually all at once, we would have been destroyed as a result of it. It's just too much. And so God, by little and little, is going to continue to build. And this is why you have to be faithful before God. We need to be loyal, constant, and steadfast because the Christian life is a marathon. You're not sprinting. You're not going right to the finish line like this. It's just little by little by little by little. And if you quit for a bit, you set yourself back. And then you got to get back up to little and little and little and little. Just keep going. Keep at it. Keep praying. Keep reading your Bible. Keep following God. Keep slowing. Keep doing the commandments. Keep hearkening unto the judgments. Keeping them and doing them. By little and little, God will give you growth. And then you'll look back five years, ten years, twenty years from now. You're still in the same church. Your kids are grown. Your family's grown. Your, 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 your loved ones in Christ have, have grown. And, and you'll look back and just be like, wow, look at all that has happened. Look how strong in the Lord I am. My family's strong in the Lord. This didn't happen overnight. It's been God, the faithful God, allowing me to be faithful unto Him and growing little by little by little by little until I could stand here today and look back and rejoice. Verse 23 says, But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. It's His work. It's His doing. It's His responsibility. Just let Him. Verse 24, And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven, and there shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou have destroyed them. No man is going to stand before you. No king is going to stand before you. There's no challenge that can overcome you. We've got to understand that he's the one doing it. He's the one, like we started off this chapter, that is carrying us in, that is helping us through, that is giving us the statutes to hearken. And when we hearken and do them, He gives us the blessings that fall through. He grows us little by little by little by little by little by little. And He's with us all along the way. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. There's one more place I'll go to. Again, if God's carrying you, that means He's right there with you. You're not doing the effort. He's doing the effort. He's lifting you. He's holding you. He's sustaining you. He's bringing you. John chapter 10, verse 24, Then came the Jews round about Him and said unto Him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. Your God's actually given them the truth. He told them straight forward to their face, plainly, what they're asking him to now say. They doubted. They were in unbelief of it. Okay? So they missed it. I told you, you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You have the assurance of Christ's care and provision in bringing you through. And greater than that, he says, my Father is greater than all. No man is able to pluck you out of his hand. We're one. We're working together in this. We are, we are united in this, in our care for you. No man ever will remove you from that. He is the shepherd. You are the sheep. Follow him as he was faithful and is faithful unto you. Be faithful unto him and accept no substitutes. Accept no substitutes for the care and the provision of the mighty and terrible faithful and awe-inspiring God of heaven. Back in Deuteronomy 
7 and verse 25. It says, The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared thereon. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be cursed like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. Accept no substitutes. What are you saying? He just built himself up with all of these. You can be blessed. You can be multiplied. None of you will be barren. You'll have everything you'll need. Even when you're doubting, God will put faith into you to persevere and to push through. He's going to build you up by little and little. He is the mighty and terrible and faithful God. He's going to do it all. All you have to do is trust and follow Him. Don't worry about these graven images. Don't follow after these cursed things. They're nothing. Don't desire those things. These people that are going to turn you away from serving God, don't want nothing for them. Just only want the Lord and what He has for you. It's always going to be better when you do what God wants and what His will for your life is, He's right there behind you to give you a blessing for doing the same. If you do right, you're blessed, and you're blessed for doing right. I mean, that's the greatest deal. Otherwise, you can just take your rock and carve it into an image and beg it for something. What's going to happen? If you make graven images in your life, some faithful believer is going to show up on your doorstep. God will knock you out of your place, give you his place. He'll give him your place, and he'll just take your idol and throw it in fire. Have God. Trust God. Believe God. Follow God. Hearken unto the judgments. Keep and do them, and he'll give you mercy. He'll keep that covenant. He'll carry you through. Even when you doubt, thou shalt well remember the last time that he gave you a verse. The last time that he fulfilled a promise. The last time that he did a miracle in your life and you continue growing little and little and little growing in Christ.